Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Libby Seguin, the manager of the Center on Law and Finance here at the University of Chicago Law School. We are thrilled to host you today for our final event of 2021. We have a great book discussion on Samuel Milner's new book, Robbing Peter to Pay Paul, Power, Profits, and Productivity. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the law school's YouTube channel in the coming days. Please have your microphone on mute. And if you do have a question for our panel, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom right of your screen. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel for today. First, we have Prof Professor Todd Henderson. Professor Henderson is the Michael J. Marks Professor of Law here at the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Henderson's research includes corporation security regulation and law and economics. He teaches classes ranging from banking regulation to torts to American Indian law. Next, we have Professor Eric Posner. Professor Posner is the Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Arthur and Esther Kane Research Chair. His research interests include financial regulation, international law, and constitutional law. Last but not least, we have the author, Samuel Milner. Samuel holds a PhD in American Economic History from Yale University, where he was formerly a lecturer in the Department of History. He is currently in his final year here at the law school and after graduation will return to Ohio to clerk on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And now Samuel, you can take it away. Well, thank you for the introduction, Libby. Thank you to Professor Henderson, Professor Posner, uh, for taking part in this discussion. Thank you to the center and uh, thank you to all for attending. Uh, you know, when I was starting to write this book as a work of history uh, over the past couple of years, you always hope there's gonna be some contemporary relevance uh, for the history. And it seems every day there's more and more, right? Every day in the newspaper, we hear first time in decades, the first time in decades, inflation has been this high. First time in decades, labor unrest has been this high. And the beautiful thing about when something's the first time in decades is that you can go back decades and look at what was it like then and how can we learn from that experience and apply that to the present. And that's what robbing Peter to pay Paul is about. It looks at the economy of the mid 20th century, the 1940s through the 1970s uh, primarily. And these are decades which have special importance both to economic historians and to uh, popular memory. These are the decades often called the golden age of American capitalism, an era in which uh, wages, median wages grow strongly as does productivity and in which uh, income inequality is at its all time 20th century low, right? As we're often reminded, very different from the past several decades in which productivity growth has slowed and in which uh, median wages in real terms have stagnated. Uh, these are also the decades known as the heyday of the New Deal order coming out of the 1930s and 1940s we have a strong interventionist regulatory state, big government, if you will. We have a strong labor movement backed by popular acclaim, which as we're reminded, uh, has not enjoyed such support in decades. And it's also an era in which antitrust enforcement is very strong, or uh, some might say reactive. Uh, again, very strong contrast to what has developed over the last several decades. And what the book looks at is how much room for maneuver did corporate management have uh, given this economic, this social, this political, legal climate? And traditionally, uh, historians would say not very much room. Management has to deal with big labor, it has to deal with big government, and it feels so trapped by these external constraints uh, that it will engage in a decades long uh, campaign, maybe a crusade even, to undercut those uh, spaces of power through political outreach, through economic, through even religious outreach, uh, culminating, many historians say, uh, with the election of Ronald Reagan. Uh, but there's a more positive spin on this, which is that in an era in which management is uh, dealing with its uh, big business and big labor, we don't necessarily hear as much about shareholders. The general conception is that shareholders are dispersed, they are unsophisticated retail investors, and they have very little sway over management at this time. 
And so uh, many look back on this period to say, this is a model for uh, stakeholder governance. When the Business Roundtable several years ago updated its uh, statement on the purpose of the corporation, to say the purpose of the corporation is no longer uh, solely to benefit shareholders, uh, but is to create an economy that benefits all Americans, right? Workers will get good wages, the environment will be protected, suppliers will get respect, uh, and the government will receive its taxes, presumably. Uh, this is a statement which implicitly is modeled on the 1950s and 1960s. And indeed, as we might talk about later uh, in this hour or so, when you look at some of the discussions of the roundtable's predecessor groups in this period, you see very similar comments that corporations must reward all of the contributor claimants to the corporation, not just their investors, but their workers, their communities, and their consumers as well. Well, it turns out, I argue though, that management did have much more autonomy in this period than we often give it credit for. And that's because management retained unilateral control over the pricing mechanism, right? When we think about the core industries of the mid-century economy, we think about big steel, big auto, right? These are industries organized in oligopoly in which several uh, producers hold most of the market share. And because of that, uh, each, each producer understanding what the others will do uh, has a higher degree of discretion over prices than we would expect in a competitive economy. And as I argue, uh, management understands that when stakeholder demands against profits increase, it can use its pricing power as a safety valve to dilute those excessive claims uh, against profits. Now, management knows this might be self-destructive in the long run. It could invite in foreign competition or domestic competition at a time in which uh, the federal government is very strongly committed to full employment. It also might mean the government will interpret a higher price level or a higher wage level as evidence that it needs to increase uh, stimulus, that it might accommodate the higher wage price level, thereby giving rise to inflation, right? This is the cost push wage price spiral theory of inflation, where first comes the higher price or wage, and then comes the expansion of fiscal and monetary demand. Now, management knows, and economists know, policymakers know, everyone who reads the newspaper knows for decades, the answer is management should follow a wage price policy, a non-inflationary wage price policy. And for decades, uh, the way this policy works will be expressed rather the same way. Wages should track the marginal productivity of labor for the economy as a whole, right? In a competitive economy, that's real wages should track uh, the marginal productivity of labor. So management should exercise its discretion uh, to reward labor that way as well. On average, that means unit labor costs should not increase. So on average, uh, prices and profit margins can also remain stable so that investors are given a steady return on their investment, even as they invest more and more capital. So just as in a competitive economy, we will have a fixed uh, distribution of income between labor and capital, but with management, the one who actually allocates that income stream to both sides. Well, the devil, of course, is how do you make sure concentrations of power will play by those rules? And Paul Samuelson, in the first edition of his economics textbook in 1948, will say, look, our biggest problem in post-war America is not fiscal policy. We solved that. It's not monetary policy. We're Keynesians. We don't believe in that. The problem is, what do you do to keep big business and big labor from siphoning off economic demand in the form of higher wages and prices before you reach the point of full employment? And as I show in the book, sometimes uh, the answer is voluntary efforts by management, just like the Business Roundtable today. For decades, management groups discussing either formally or informally at the country club, how do you measure productivity? How do you set prices? How do you use these uh, metrics in distributing income. But also uh, the government will step in imposing controls, right? Today we hear about the White House looking into the price of meat, into the price of gasoline. Well, these prices have been uh, hot button issues for decades. And in this period, uh, in addition to meat and gasoline, these cost of living issues, we also see intense scrutiny of steel prices, of auto prices, of electrical equipment prices, sometimes ad hoc interventions, 
uh, but other times formalized incomes policies or wage and price controls. And between 1960 and 1980, the economy operating under some form of incomes policy almost consistently uh, until the election of Ronald Reagan, who very quickly does away uh, with these policies. Incidentally, Reagan does away with these policies at the same time as uh, foreign as well as the shareholder revolution and increased shareholder activism and the market for corporate control uh, also develop and begin to impose more restraints on management's ability to act uh, without regard to shareholders uh, as their prime interest. So that in a nutshell is uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? The story of how did management distribute income and how did public policy respond over these decades? And so what I'd like to do for uh, the rest of this program is invite Professor Henderson and Professor Posner to think about some of the ways that history uh, can inform our present day concerns on some of these uh, same issues. So I thought one place to start might be the question of cause and effect or uh, symptoms versus structure. For most of the mid-century, uh, when people talked about these problems, they understood well, there's concentrations of economic power. There is big business, there is big labor. But very rarely do we see uh, true efforts to use antitrust or labor law or corporate law to restructure uh, those underlying power or to dissipate that power as it might be. Um, after 1954, the Supreme Court says in theater enterprises that if a oligopoly will follow each other's prices, that is economically self-rational. Today, we might say some more game theory, but that is still the way we look at uh, conscious parallel pricing. It is presumably fine under the Sherman Act. Uh, and so there will be some half-hearted efforts to revise antitrust law, but as I noted, most of the efforts will be focused on the outcomes, making sure that if you have power, you use it responsibly rather than uh, trying to target that power at the source. Now, it seems to me, and, and again, Professor Posner, and Professor Henderson, uh, feel free to, to join in. Uh, today, though, it seems like in addition to concern about the outcomes of power, we also have more concern about the source of power, whether that is concentration, a weakening of antitrust law, or on the corporate side, perhaps, uh, whether we need changes to corporate law, as opposed to merely uh, changing the attitudes that corporate managers, corporate directors have, uh, and how they use that power. Uh, does that seem like a fair way to, to say that uh, we now recognize that structure uh, and not just uh, symptoms uh, are, are worthy of political debate and uh, legal reform? Sam, can I jump in? I just want sure. to ask about some of the, you know, the basic logic sure. of, of your argument. Um, and so I, I, how the wage and in particular how the wage policy, the wage price policy worked. And um, so what I, I don't understand, so there's something I don't understand about it. So you have, um, you know, you would expect in an oligopoly that the, the firms would choose whatever the optimal oligopoly price is. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, you know, the kind of idea was they would choose that price, make super competitive profits, but or rents and share some of them with the employees in the union and retain the rest for themselves. So, you know, both sides are happy. You, you keep talking about though, was it, it, I, I don't understand. So you keep talking about though, that in the wage in the spiral that, they, that the, um, the managers raise prices, presumably beyond, I mean, I don't understand. Are they raising prices beyond the oligopoly price that is already by hypothesis optimal? They do that. They're going to lose. They're going to lose sales, and they'll have less money to pay the union. Is there some kind of breakdown? So, so yeah. say more so that I, I can understand this. Sure. So, so the issue, um, and this is debated a lot in the, in the nineteen fifties, is you know, are we actually at the optimal price for the oligopoly or not? And the fact that you do see uh, price increases every year by uh, you know, by the steel industry. And it's always, you know, the same price leader moving first and everyone else follows. Uh, it leads to a lot of concern about, well, maybe uh, one possibility is that they're not at the optimal price. They're worried about exceeding that optimal price 
And so every year they take the opportunity to probe and try and get closer and closer. Um, so they're probably getting there. Maybe they exceeded it, but every year they're trying to pick what that is based on, based on uh, where they're at now. Uh, so that's, that's one idea of the 50s. The other idea is that uh, they recognize that maybe they can't go whole hog as it is up to that optimal point, right? There's, if they go up to that point, there will be the political pushback. They're under investigation by Congress all the time, uh, being asked to justify their prices. The White House is putting on scrutiny. So there is that type of external scrutiny that uh, they cannot go up to the optimal point. They get to pick their point um, within maybe a suboptimal range above the competitive, but below the, you know, what we would expect where they're always, if they knew perfectly, assuming they do know perfectly. Right, but how, how does this fit in your story? I, I, and, you know, it could also be just increasing demand, right? Right. Because the economy is booming, people want right. more steel so they can raise prices. Right. And that but, is, you know, yeah. But, but, but why would there, I mean, let's just suppose hypothetically that they know what they're doing and mm -hmm. they just charge the oligopoly price at all times. Maybe they overshoot it sometimes, but maybe they undershoot it sometimes, but then sometimes they'll overshoot it and then they'll have to lower prices. So, you, you know, you wouldn't. So, so then what, why, why do they, you know, so what's going on? Then they turn around and they say to the to the union, we're extracting as much wealth as we can from the consumers. Let's divvy it up, right? And uh, now they may not be able to agree on the division, right? So a strike occurs and then they, you know, recalibrate and maybe uh, uh, managers raise wages, maybe they don't, whatever, right? But it's not clear to me what the instability is here or why this would, would result in an inflation, uh, you know, separate from whatever, you know, real factors are taking place. Right, right. And, and, I, and I just want to yeah. I just want to add, you know, the whole thing falls apart as you, you know, as you as you talk about. But, you know, the kind of simple explanation for why it fell apart is, you know, there's the Vietnam War and there's there's oil shock in the 70s and, and blah, blah, you know, and all that and then and business, you know maybe they figure out that they can get an even larger share of the surplus if they, if they you know, persuade the public and government to beat down uh, labor. I mean, that all makes sense to me, but, but I, I guess I don't understand what you, you know, what you think about what was going on you know, prior to that with, with the wage price policy. And, and so one way to put this question, are you saying that it was inherently unstable and so it was bound to fall apart at some point or that, you know, people just made mistakes and that caused it to fall apart or, or, you know, something else. Can I, can I just jump in with one sure. observation? I, I think what Eric's driving at is, uh, and since this is the University of Chicago, I feel free to invoke <laughs> Milton Friedman at any time. Uh, Milton Friedman said inflation is everywhere and always a monetary problem. Right. And a way of, I think, interpreting Eric's question is, it seems like throughout the narrative, the economists of the time were not buying into that, that they were suggesting that price increases could lead to inflation and that we, we needed to restrain that and wage demands because that could lead to inflation. And I think Friedman's response is, no, 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 Eric's right. There's some fundamental economic supply and demand and prices and so forth and so on. And inflation is always a monetary problem. And if they're, if they're, first of all, is that right? And is there getting that, if it is right, or the, is it they're getting it that wrong that leads to this kind of sturm und drang, which is really just, you know, founded on an economic fallacy, but leads to all these, you know, government actions, which just sort of exacerbate uh, problems? Yeah. I mean, when you look at the way, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve thinks at this time, right? If you're looking at in the 19, certainly by the 1970s, there's this great moment where uh, Arthur Burns, who's uh, been installed at, as Fed chair by this point, he says, look, he goes, the government can stop inflation. Inflation's monetary, absolutely. But it's also political. And for us to do what it takes to stop inflation using monetary policy alone, the public's going to go, no, they can't tolerate 4% unemployment, let alone however high we have to raise it. Now, Paul Volcker, you know, he has a different political calculus. He says, once people understand it's monetary, inflation will go away. And, and um, you know, maybe part of that is, is beneficial oil shocks in the mid eighties, but certainly 
we do see, you know, real interest rates falling consistent with the idea that, you know, the Federal Reserve has credibility about future expectations and, and all that good story. And certainly when you look at the macro trends, um, you know, I am not, I am not saying that, that uh, monetary economics is wrong. And certainly if you look at that, you would say, aha, we have, you know, a Federal Reserve, we have a uh, economy that is overheating and we have, you know, you can use that to explain what's going on. Um, but again, on part of the reason is, well, why did we let it get that bad, right? And that is, well, they love this idea that inflation is caused by uh, market power increasing prices, right? They see the Great Depression uh, coming out of this idea in the 1920s, 1930s, seeing the Great Depression as, well, business kept its prices too high and it cut output. And that is self-destructive when everyone does it. And so the problem was uh, this underconsumption theory, people did not, you know, the companies kept too much money from themselves, the workers didn't have enough money, and so demand collapsed. Do we believe that today? Probably not, but it's the story that uh, undergirds policy in the 1930s. It's the story then, the flip side of that story in the 1940s. Maybe labor now has too much money, maybe they're getting too much, and then the companies will have to raise prices. Every, right? If the wages go higher, then unemployment will rise and the government will have to step in and accommodate that. And so that is uh, this theory that really supports, I think, a lot of uh, the policy making. So again, you have to see, the, explain the macro story, I think, with these models of the way, and models which probably are incorrect, uh, I, I think at least the way I learned economics, they're, they're very incorrect um, to me. And it's always a little strange to but say- Sam, oh, Sam yeah. can, I, can I come back sure. to my question? My, my question was simpler. It, it was just, is your view that the wage policy, um, the wage price policy was inherently unstable because you know, management, management just, you know, there was some kind of self-commitment problem or, yeah. or is it, or, I mean, it seems much, I mean, I think the conventional wisdom is that there are a bunch of shocks in the seventies or maybe the sixties, definitely the seventies that destroyed everything, mm -hmm. including, you know, globalization, you talk about a lot of this stuff, but what if there hadn't been, would it have just continued on indefinitely or, or is there somehow some way that it was inherently unstable? I guess I, I just don't see why, why it would be, but, but I'm, you know, what's your view? Yeah, I think my, um, so I, I would say two things. Um, the first is we almost saw this in the late 50s in a way, the breakdown, when you do start to get uh, the late 50s recessions. Um, they're sharp, people don't quite understand what's going on. And you do see management now, well, we used to be able to split these rents with you, labor, uh, but times have gone down and you got a lot, now you have to give back. And so you start to see the frictions there and we can, part because management says we just can't raise the money. But also, I think, because management, again, is thinking, uh, you know, they're not just seeing the, the macro trends, they're also rethinking, well, you know, what is productivity? How does that tell us with wages? The 1970s, then, is the much more pronounced story, where, um, you know, partially it's, as I said, the bad, uh, the bad you know, macroeconomic policies sustaining things, uh, but also, um, you know, some some of the other. It's easy to see why the system would break down under foreign competition, right? You don't right. have a, an oligopoly anymore. It, you know, right. and it's an assumption of the wage price policy that industry has an oligopoly, so it can control prices. Right, and you that, start to that, see that. that that I get. Um, right. and, and, I, and I think, I, and and you see, I think management. Um, I th it's certainly in certain of these industries, you start to see the competition coming in, even in steel, you start to see it in the 1960s, well before, and then they get voluntary quotas and that pushes off a lot of the, a lot of the ultimate collapse of the eighties. Um, okay. So but what, but yeah. there's a simple, there's a sim simple story here, right? Sure. Which is just the, you know, after world war II, you just happen to have a high level of concentration in these really important industries right. that employ millions of workers. The, you know, the, the, the uh, oligopolists, you know, want to maintain their market power, but they, they're afraid of strikes. And I guess there's, there's public opinion that supports mm -hmm. labor. So they're going to have to give a bigger share to labor than they would, uh, you know, if they exercise their monopsony power on the, on, the, on the labor side. And so they do, right? And then there's this really hard problem 
of, uh, you know, like figuring out what productivity really is and what demand is. And presumably labor might not trust management and vice versa. And there are all the inherent problems that labor leaders would have in maintaining discipline among the rank and file. And you talk about this, you know, very nicely, you know, like just leadership changes in the in a union could cause everything to fall apart because someone decides that we should be more aggressive and try to get a bigger a bigger uh, share of the pie. And then, uh, you know, that, that ends uh, with the introduction of foreign competition and, um, and some shocks, which probably, you know, disrupted arrangements enormously. Uh, so, uh, so, so I, I can see that. Um, but I, under the, the story I'm giving, there's like nothing particularly obje objectionable about the wage price policy. It's just an accommodation mm -hmm. that, uh, and if there are really, you know, I don't quite understand, if they're really paying the workers their, their marginal productivity, they're, um, you know, that's efficient. You know, they're, they're generating, on the, at least on the labor side, efficient outcomes. Um, so, uh, so basically, there's just a kind of a tax on, on people who buy cars, and that goes to the people who make cars. Right, right. And then part of the, you know, you know to get in the mindset again of, of the era, right, GM can afford that. Right. GM can afford they're they're big. They have lots of productivity Ford, you know, certainly, you know, five dollar day. If we want to go back to the original, you know, some of the original models of this. Um, the question is, what happens with everyone else? Right. Will that be, uh, you know, some upward cost pressures? If, if the most efficient are setting the pace, maybe a bit like, you know, the way we see Amazon today. Right. They, they're the most efficient. They come in, raise wages. And, and what do the other people do? Um, and so that's that's part of the concern too that 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 cost disease. But I think to get at your point, no, I, I I agree entirely. I think I think you can say this is you know when it's possible to share the rents. Uh, times are good. You know the early to mid 1950s in particular. You know you want business continuity. You don't want the strike. Absolutely. Um, you see it with the steel industry later on. They're very afraid of strikes more so than of competition because they're worried a strike will disrupt production and invite in competition. So absolutely, you know, we'll, we'll share it as, as we can. Um, the question- okay, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you another question about antitrust law, which I found, you know, you, you talk about it from time to time and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that. Is it possible? I, I just, you know, I've never looked back at a lot of these, at, at, well, really these sources aside from some of the cases, but is it possible that the reason that I don't know, the, the Supreme Court or whoever, you know, whoever had power, believe that parallel pricing should be lawful and shouldn't be subject to antitrust challenge was, you know, not the kind of the traditional explanation given by scholars like Donald Turner, but that they didn't want to disturb the, the you know, the wage price uh, system that you're talking about, right? Because, the, you know, the whole system depended on the uh, the industry being in, an oligopoly, and you know, I, I know in the 19th century anyway, unions often, you know, wanted the industry to be cartelized so that they, you know, didn't have to worry about driving, you know, their employer out of their counterpart out of business. If the whole industry is cartelized, you know, they can, you know, they whatever they just negotiate with the entire industry. Um, is there any evidence of that though? I'm just kind of, it's just kind of striking. Is there any evidence that, I don't know, I kind of hard to believe that Supreme Court justice would think this way, but I don't know, people in government, you know, actually didn't want antitrust law to apply to parallel pricing so as to, you know, maintain the system. I think so. I, I think, um, I don't know if anyone would ever say it expressly, but I think you can certainly see hints of that. Certainly, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, when it comes down time to, you know, multi-employer bargaining, uh, you know, again, you know, maybe the flip side of, of what we're saying with this is saying, well, we're not really sure why it's good, but we've always allowed it. And certainly I think they're coming out of the, you know, the industrial laundries or the garment it shops or something where you want to have all the, you know, take the wages out of competition. So it's easier to, you know, stabilize that, stabilize the prices, prevent the downward competition. So I think that uh, certainly is there. I'm not sure if I've ever seen the government say we want the you know cartelized industry to pay. Maybe maybe some thinkers in the 20s or the 30s, some of the more you know uh, on the progressive spectrum, uh, were thinking like that. But you certainly do see, I think, the idea that this idea that our solution to the problem is 
uh, to the problem of concentrated industry is having concentrated interest groups to bargain with industry. So, you know, the Gardner means theory of uh, almost a corporatist solution, that's going to rely on having uh, big business, you know, in that, in that organization. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, so weird well, because that does come through. Because as you point out, you know, this is the high point of antitrust enforcement, particularly for mergers, right? right. And, and yet at the same time, it's also the high point of, uh, God, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe not now, but there, there is something about like everybody, everybody kind of tolerating or even being happy that we've got these big oligopolies, or at least just seeing this as normal and part of, you know, something that public policy should address, not by tearing them apart, or but by trying to, you know, cajole them to give a reasonable amount of their rents to to labor and not raise price uh, prices too much. I, I just think that is a kind of an interesting uh, mystery because, you know, you might think you should allow lots of mergers to occur. So like in the banking industry, the banking industry was highly fragmented at the time. Banks tried to merge, they were blocked. You know, there's the mm -hmm. famous Philadelphia bank case. But you know, why wouldn't you know, government think, oh, well, we want the banking system to be like the steel industry and the automobile industry. Um, and uh, obviously they didn't think that way. They must've just thought these, these industries were distinctive in some way, probably because the history of labor unrest. I guess you don't have that with banks. Yeah, yeah uh, I think bank, banks get their own special, special yeah, story. Well, they're, they're treated uh, differently. Yeah, I mean, a similar uh, concern or, uh, so first of all, congratulations on the book and everybody who's listening should read the book. It's really great. Uh, it's some tough sledding because there's a bunch of history that I had no idea about and there's a, there's a lot of richness to it but it's really worth it. The payoff is, is pretty good. I, I didn't know any of this. And I have a new hero, Lemuel Bulware, who uh, I never heard of, but is a, it seems like a good, good bloke to me. Um, the, the part, there's another element to, I had a similar reaction to what Eric said. So there's a corporate kind of governance thing going on here with stakeholder capitalism, which is obviously much in the news. You don't really talk about uh, those issues through the history, you kind of raise them in the beginning and the end about stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And it's a little unclear because, uh, you know, executive compensation is really changing over this period. Um, you know, the managers sort of taking more for themselves fits a little uncomfortably with the facts that, you know, managers were paid pretty much cash, some bonuses for most of those periods and corporate CEOs weren't making tons of money. Uh, back back in most of this period. Um, uh, the thing that struck me along the lines of what Eric suggested about the antitrust was, you know, in the early 60s, you see the first rise of activist shareholders and takeovers. And the idea that this would, you know, disrupt this kind of big triad of government, big business and labor. Uh, and then, you know, Congress pretty much shuts it down with the Williams Act, uh, among other things. Uh, and then you really don't see a big change. And then, you know, the seventies is the era of conglomerization and that fits pretty well with a story that Eric was telling that, you know, government pretty much liked the fact that big business could be identifiable and they could get them into white house meetings and have these negotiations. I mean, the, the details in your book about how actively presidents were in setting prices just struck me as, you know, unbelievable. And so another lot, you know, conspiracy theory version of Eric's question is, was the pushback against takeovers uh, of a piece with what he suggested? It's like, no, no, we like the fact that we know that we can get U.S. Steel in the room or General Motors or GE in the room. And the last thing we want is those things taken up, broken up, different managers involved, people with a more of a focus on returning money for shareholders. Like, no, 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 we have this piece and this very delicate balance that we struck we need to stop those for that for those reasons. Yeah, I mean, if you, um, you know, Galbraith, right, when he's writing at this time and say, you know, that's, you like big, right? You like big for that reason, because then it stabilizes, right? You have government and business and labor. And I mean, that that is that is the Galbraithian economy. And, you know, does he have, you know, does that idea have clout? Certainly it does to um, a lot of people. I mean, I don't know if you would say, you know, when, when Lyndon Johnson is calling in uh, General Electric, would you say, you know, he wants, 
I think he's not thinking in those terms. I don't know if his economic advisors uh, are thinking in those terms, but I, I think you could see to some degree the idea that, well, we're here and we know these are known quantities. Nixon certainly, when, when, when you know, the Nixon administration is looking into conglomerization, I think that is part of the story too, is that they're so, they're so worried that, well, what happens if you allow this? Will things get worse? Will you have all these new powers that we don't, you know, will the business side get even stronger compared to what it is now? Um, that seems to me to be part of the fear of, of conglomerization, which probably doesn't have uh, a whole lot of water seeing how a lot of those conglomerates ended up in the 70s. Um, so no, I, I think I, I do think that that might be a, an interesting way to put it. And again, it's something where you probably won't see them saying on paper, well, you know, it's easier for us, it's more familiar for us. But when you take a step back and say, coming out of that idea of the 30s, where we have to have these rival interest groups balanced, if that's the basis of the post-war economy, then certainly uh, you want to keep those groups cohesive and balanced and coming back every year, repeat players. Well, more, uh, I want to ask about shareholders also. Like, what, what did shareholders think uh, during this period? Um, did they, is there, are there any, is there any documentation of them objecting to the system? You know, the, the odd thing here is that you might think they thought they would think it was terrific just the way the managers do. They don't want labor unrest either. So, I guess I wonder whether there would really be pressure from shareholders to um, destroy the system, especially because the managers weren't even paid very much, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, what, 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 what was their thinking? And, and, I, and by the way, there's nowhere else for them to put their money. I mean, it's not like they're going to be investing in Japan or Europe. I mean, there was very little choice for them as well. They were extremely constrained in their uh, uh, ability to move their money. Oh, I, when I when I used to teach uh, political economy and I used to do my my lectures on you know uh, financial repression and banking reforms at this time and and where money goes and savings and loans and thrifts oh it, it is it's a world that I can't understand and you know that's kind of my degree is to try and understand that world um, you know investors don't it's it's very interesting they so rarely show up in the story um, and if they do show up it's often they are being told, you know, why, why by management, this is, this is a good move, right? So GE will put out a statement saying, you know, this is why we're doing our prices and our wages. And, and this is why you should think this is in the best interest of, of you as well as, as of all the stakeholders. Um, very rarely with the, you know, the exceptions you might see uh, that I'm familiar with were when you do have an outside, uh, an outsized, I should say, uh, shareholder. So, uh, and the one that comes to mind is, you know, DuPont, you know, still having a large stake in General Motors at this time. And they are completely happy, you know, well, they're the ones on the board. They're saying, that, let's do this. Let's do this. That might be a special case. Um, but I think what we say, as you know, as you said, they get steady production. You know, the dividends are being paid. The steel industry always says, you know, we got to keep paying our dividends. And, and part of that might be to say, you know, we don't want anyone complaining. The shareholders don't care as long as they get their dividend every quarter. Um, at least that's the way the steel industry told the Kennedy administration. That's what we have to do. So, so shareholders are shareholders are doing much better now. I get. I, I think. I guess they are right. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Are they doing much better now? I mean, is the growth rate? Uh, I guess. Do you have any idea? I believe. Maybe I mean, I, I know the long term. They say it, is steady. It I, I change right. Yeah. Over the long term. The real return on capital doesn't change very much, right? It's, it's right. Kind of odd to think think in that in those terms. Right, and I, I know a lot of it too. Is if you look at the what I know is the capital labor split, and I know a lot of that. So that's changed, that is, right? And that is changing. Um, if you net out depreciation, it's not as strong. But so but, so you know, so, so what what's what's going going on? And this is partly a question about the future. So so you might think that. The share, shareholders woke up in the 60s, as Todd said, or the 70s, and they said, this is actually not a good system for us. Our rents are going to the workers. We don't like that. And so, the, as you mentioned, you know, they start pushing for reforms and all that, you know, all that stuff, and, and especially maybe of labor law and um, deregulation. But their returns don't go up. Why don't their returns go up? Then? And you know they succeed in reducing 
labor's um, you know share of uh, income. So you know that's a victory for them, but they don't actually make more money as a result. I guess it could be that the economy isn't growing as rapidly. Then you want to you wonder well, maybe that's because this you know wonderful system is gone. Um, but uh, you know that's a little that's kind of odd to think that the cartel the cartelized system grew was more economically efficient, grew more rapidly than the highly competitive system. So what do you think? And then I guess, are we now seeing a kind of a cycle back with, it's not just the labor unrest, it's kind of the broader concern about inequality and, and labor's, you know, lower share, which is, you know, illustrated for a layperson much more clearly in just the stagnation of wages at the median and lower uh, level. Um, is there going to be, you think there could be some kind of, of um, you know, recreation of this system, presumably in a different form. It's kind of hard to imagine unions coming back the way they were before, but, you know, I, I don't know. What, what, what do you think? Uh, you know, well, I, I, I guess I have to, I have to differentiate what I would like to see and then what I think, where I think we might be heading. No, right? no, we're not interested uh, in what you'd like to exactly, see. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I, I, you know, part of the problem could, part of the answer could be too, that, you know, we, we talk about it, uh, you know, capital labor, the money could be sloshing around in a lot of other directions. You know, the profits are retained, the profits are going to management, as we said, the executive compensation. Does that explain all of it? Probably not. Yeah, that can't but, be enough. You know, right, can right. explain some of it? Maybe, maybe some of it. Um, I mean, I think where we're heading now, it's, I mean, if you would ask me six months ago, I would have said, well, we're, we're, we're still on the same track. And, and now, now the question is, is, you know, is one, um, you know, uh, one Buffalo Starbucks enough to change the world? Probably not. Uh, you know, not if Amazon is, is not changing. Uh, but, you know, it's also that idea that, look, we're, we're, you know, where's the money going to? It's a global decline in, uh, in the labor share, right? And so, you know, is that due to China and, and offshoring? Probably that, that's, you know, that seems to line up chronologically. So if we see some type of reshoring, will that, uh, allow us to go back to some version of this splitting of the rents. You know that's plausible. Um, you know I think I think the idea too that if you have you know managerial interest in in you know an efficiency wage too is that enough to to stave off you know again what we're seeing with Amazon or Starbucks uh, un until last week is that enough to say we will start shifting things back and back. Uh, but without the union, you know, so it will still be a unilateral. Right, but it, it's also in tension with the current, you know, antitrust sentiment, right? I mean, it, right. it's odd, right? Pro progressives like Lena Khan, you know, they should be pro big business so that it can be cartelized and give a share of its rents to the workers. Right. Instead. And especially, that, yeah, I mean, I guess, too, it's with... Um, it's interesting because, you know, for all this time in the mid-century, we always talk about wage price and, you know, the consumer is always the odd man out, right? The consumer is always the one who says, well, hey, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have an organized interest group to go lobby for lower prices or something. So now that we see, you know, the Lena Khan story, well, Amazon's bad because consumers are actually bearing all these costs that they don't realize they're bearing. It's not just the workers, it's actually the consumers. That would be an interesting dynamic where if you actually, if the FTC, which, you know, if you note in the book, the FTC is does not want to deal with any of the wage price story for most of the, the mid-century. But now if you start to see those, you know, that story saying we're the consumer interest, uh, you know, the worker interest, that's passe, the management interest, that we're the consumer interest, that's what's going to be pushing forward. And that's what's going to decide the contours of antitrust and the contours of managerial policy. That would make a different story. One thing that is uh, throughout the book that you don't really face head on, or you allude to it a bunch of times, is related to something that uh, Matt Bodie put in the chat, which was this curve that looks at the change in productivity and wages mm -hmm. and a break and a gap that has uh, been since the sort of Reagan revolution period. Um, you know, that's certainly a fact that people use today to say that this system that you describe, which, you know, is not appealing to me as a Friedman type uh, and the government machinations, it all seems like a complete failure to me. Uh, but people use this fact as a, as a rebuttal or so we should come back to something like that. 
you know, I think there is some uh, another thread that's related in, in something you talk about, which, is, which uh, goes to that, which is the rise of, or the use of fringe benefits, mm -hmm. which was a way sort of around some of these constraints. Um, and of course, today you see a much bigger portion of pay in things like benefits, especially healthcare. So I think people have tried to change that curve to add in transfers and it looks a lot different. Right. Um, so, you know, that's something that there's a big debate about that. I realize you don't want to take that all on in this book, but like the underlying facts are not so obvious to me. I mean, I've seen lots of different back and forths on that. I can't really form a strong opinion, but it's not so clear cut, I think, as the some some would suggest. Right. Um, and then the other thing that kind of comes up, which I think is a little bit interesting, is this idea that people are now pushing towards more stakeholder versions of you know the, the managerial role that corporations should take into consideration all these other factors you know e and s and g um you know i think that's probably a recipe for disaster because you know uh the 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 more you can give managers discretion and the less accountable they are to just things like you know value in as the stock market determines the more flexibility they have and why do we think they're going to use that flexibility to do things that are good for and then insert whatever it is you care about the environment labor you know whatever like they just have more discretion and that discretion will be used in ways that they want to use it could be to serve their own interests it could be to serve their pet projects um you know so i see a lot of like hand waving about oh we're good for this or that the other thing it's like well you know how do we know there aren't real metrics for that. So the more discretion you put in, like, I'm not confident managers will use that to, to good ends. Right, although metrics that don't measure the right thing also produce bad ends. I mean, if you look at the sure. graph that was, that was, I mean, it is really shocking and it's totally in tension with your view and because there was greater productivity, uh, you know, higher productivity increases be, before you know, the 80s, and there was greater uh, economic growth as well. And, you know, and, and not only that, you know, there's more foreign competition. So you would have expected that to improve growth. And it's just, it's just very strange, very strange. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the, what <laughs> the managers had all of this discretion back in the 50s and the 60s. And here, here was a period of, you know, immense economic growth. Now, maybe that none of that really matters, that it's just, you know, mysterious technological changes and demographic changes and things like that that are driving these things. Um, but I, but what do you think, Sam, about the business roundtable uh, uh, announcement? I mean, it, it does have this kind of, sm it smacks a bit of desperation. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that it's really gonna constrain these companies in any way, but obviously they're, they're, they're afraid of something. Right, and, right. And I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, just to sharpen the, the question, you know, what if they like continued down this route? Like they, they seem to have said, at least, you know, as a matter of rhetoric, it's no more just, you know, maximizing shareholder return. Now we're going to take into account other stuff. I mean, could that lead to something, some version of what was going on with the wage price policy? Or I don't know. What do you think? You know, it could. Um, I'm a little skeptical. I, I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of it just because it's easy to say. Um, you know, as I, as, I, as I say in the close of the book, is that, um, you know, you're always going to have to deal with workers. You're always going to have to deal with suppliers. You're always going to have to deal with government regulators. You know, you might do it with a smile on your face. You might do it begrudgingly. Um, but to say, you know, for, for the business roundtable to say, well, we're going to, you know, you could take that to mean we're going to treat those guys just as good as we treat our shareholders. And that's, I think, what they want you to say. The other way to do it is say, we're going to have to deal with these guys anyways. And when we do, you know, we're just going to go in and we're going to treat them, you know, with a smile on our face, right? We're going to treat them uh, with a little more respect, as a little more, if you will, a long-term relationship rather than let's just get everything we can out of them uh, to begin with. That doesn't sound to me to be a, a big break, though, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it, you, know, you know, as I, as I, as I listen to you, you know, I think in the, in the fifties and sixties, the managers weren't being nice, right? They weren't using their discretion to be nice. They were, they had, they were forced by labor to give them a share of the rents and that's all that was going on. 
without a strong labor movement, it's kind of hard to imagine modern businesses, the, the members of the business roundtable, doing anything other than saying that they'll do stuff. Yeah, but it may that's be that that's what they're trying to anticipate. You know, in a way, they're trying to anticipate a resurgent uh, either labor movement or more likely uh, just you know pro labor policies in the government and and trying to trying to forestall that. Yeah, you asked what they were afraid of. They're afraid of Elizabeth Warren. And this could be just a nod to be like, look, we'll we'll get our own house in order because we're afraid of the stuff that's in Samuel's book. Like, <laughs> we know this history. We don't want to return to that. Um, I'm glad you say thing, that. The that other that's reason to be, having to admit that. No. <laughs> yeah, the other reason to be skeptical that it's going to have a really significant effect is you would need to resurrect the anti-takeover uh apparatus which has sort of largely gone by the wayside because you know paul singer and elliot management you, you know you start giving back huge shares to labor in ways that don't inure the benefit of shareholders and you're going to find yourself pretty quickly in trouble right. uh so and unless you're now, now that you got you have big institutional shareholders who at least purport to be on board with the, what the business roundtable suggested i mean i think a lot of that is just marketing in a world of passive investing they're just trying to get flows um, so they're just sort of signaling. But if you could convince institutional shareholders to also buy into this meaningfully with the way they vote, then you end up with a kind of market version of what they were, what we had in the 60s. And then you could get back to this world. Why anybody would want to, I can't imagine, but I guess that would do it. Well, people, you know, people who make less than the like, uh 50th percentile want to go back to that world yep mm -hmm. and and you know the what the, you know if the, what kind of straightforward way of reading that graph that you were referring to from matthew Bodhi, and i think uh uh matthew Bodhi or somebody in the chat pointed this out is the what i mean what it looks like is that you know there's a kind of a cartel operating in a different way you've got Right, so you've got um, lower economic growth and a lower uh, share of um, value going to, uh, share of income going to labor. You know, how's, how, how could that be in the interest of the shareholders? Well, the answer is the, their larger portion of the share compensates for the fact that the pie is small, right? Um, so we have this massive inefficiency generated by <laughs> the collapse of your, car, you know, the, the cartel system of the 50s and 60s. Uh, so, you know, that's strange, but, you know, possible. Now, the, the institutional investors, you know, there's this whole literature now about how they might be cartelizing capital mm -hmm. markets. It's hard to believe, though, that they're going to want to, you know, transfer resources to labor um, as opposed to, um, you know, just, again, maximizing returns for the people who actually own shares of the funds that the institutional investors uh, operate. But, you know, if labor gets enough power, they, they you know, it'll be easier now. They, they're, they're like three entities that they have to negotiate with and they own the entire economy rather than just a handful of industries, BlackRock, Vanguard, well, and State one, Street. Yeah, one response to this uh, chart thing, just to reiterate the point I made about uh, fringe benefits, this is on page 67 of Samuel's uh, excellent book. In 1955, 14% of Ford's labor costs were fringe benefits. Today, the average is 40%. So, and, and that's not showing up in the chart that-, that, that No, no, when, when, when economists calculate the labor share of income, they look at everything. They don't just look at it, nominal wages. When, for sure, this chart that, he's, that he showed is wages. Yeah, fine, but the- uh, okay. I mean, I, I'm not yeah. I'm not defending the current U.S. healthcare system or that it's provided by employers, but a huge growth in uh, in total return. No, no, no. no the, the graph says compensation is wages and benefits, so it's not just wages. It wouldn't make so any sense of, just to have wages. Yeah, a, a lot of those studies, um, you know, a lot of those graphs will. will as Professor Anderson says, they do tend to undercut a lot of the benefits where they're valuing them, you know, if there's a pension or, you know, that will be paid out of the future and how do you backdate it? So, so there is that undercounting there I, I, I've seen when I've read a lot of these. Um, but if you look at then, you know, so if you look at the average wage, well, the average wage 
still looks like it's going up pretty well. But if you look at the median wage, if you start breaking that out by what is executive yeah, the and the white blue, collar, right. collar now, now you start yeah. to see those differences, especially right. average, wage, collar doesn't average have wage reflects, you know, the distribution, right? So, right. you know, if my salary goes up from its current amount of let's call it $40,000 a year to a hundred billion dollars a year, then the average wage is going to go up a lot. Right. That's not what the debate's about. Right. 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 So it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, and it's also, I mean, Professor Henderson, I quoted my book, so I'm not going to argue with that at all. Uh, but, you know, I also say, you know, there are other ways to count, even at the time, right, that they count other fringe benefits differently, depending on, uh, you know, what, what is getting included, what's not. And, and so, you know, it's one of those beautiful things, right, you know, lying with statistics in a way, but you put them all together and we see a picture, we see the mosaic, and there is a story there that's uh, uh, not, just, not just the figment, I think. Um, so, but I mean, another version of this is just, you could do taxes. I mean, as I was reading this whole thing, I'm thinking, you know, one version is the government is just negotiating in the White House about how much to pay people. The other version is we just tax the rich people, you know, accepting this chart is true, just tax rich people and give cash transfers to people and don't get in the business of trying to set wages and prices and all the machinations that are going on, just do tax and transfer. And if there are macro forces that are driving, whether it's globalization, death of labor unions, changes in elasticities of capital labor, whatever it is, just tax rich people and have transfers to, to workers to try to even out these differences. That seems like a more efficient solution than what we had in, the, in all your chapters. Do you agree with that or? I think so. I mean, I always say, um, you know, I always compare to, you know, well, what else, you know, who, what are the other models, right? You can say, well, there's some type of Scandinavian, uh, you know, peak bargaining model. You get all the, you know, they get the trade group and the employer group in the same room and they fix this out. But you also say, well, you're going to be, you know, labor income gets taxed, but you aren't taxing the capital. So you still have the incentive to, to invest and, and stay productive that way. And the corporate tax will be, you know, different than here. Um, is that, you know, again, is that a system I like? I don't know. But is that a system that's in some way seems to work well without getting in the government involved in a lot of the nitty gritty, absolutely. Um, so I think, I think is that's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, you don't see in this period, right? We're getting into the debates about taxation and government spending. And that, that, is, that is a whole nother side effect, a political story about what is possible and what is acceptable. But I agree with you. I think that if you say, we're just gonna let everything run and then we'll just redistribute after the fact, but we'll redist, you know, if, if you can do that in a way to say, we're not taking away the incentive from the company, we're maybe from the, you know, from the labor. Right, except that productivity is lower. Right. And I so think the, 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 real, the productivity around. is lower now and the real challenge. I mean, I think one of the things that I found very stimulating about your, um, you know, your narrative is the possibility that, uh, you know, this, this weird kind of really old fashioned seeming system compared to today was actually more efficient than the, the more, you know, um, competitive, you know, system we have, which is, you know, becoming part of, I mean, that's the thing is that our system is much more cartelized than, I mean, if you put aside these industries, uh, there's much more concentration, much higher market power now than there was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things going on and you, you kind of wonder, whether you know you're just going to have a lot of market power in a you know in a in a in an economy like ours in a basic capitalist economy, some industries are just going to be very concentrated because they're economies of scale and blah blah blah. That's just you know got to happen. And in our system, we just tolerate it, and you would expect lower productivity, lower growth rates, and greater income inequality or greater inequality as a result, right? In the 50s and the 60s, they, uh, you know, they uh, they tried to regulate it, um, and you know the idea though that regulation would enhance efficiency and productivity, it's it's weird against that idea is weird against the free market baseline. But the the our real world baseline now is not free market. It's a it's a market that has pervasive uh, cartelization and ol oligopoly, mm -hmm. and so forth. So there is this kind of like, you can't help wondering whether there's a better system. You know, that's sort of what I was getting at with my earlier question, whether we might, there's a cycle going on 
and we're going to kind of recreate this better system. Why wouldn't we? If it's more efficient, if it produces a bigger pie, and it produces less, you know, unrest at the at the bottom tail of uh, income distribution, you might just expect the system over time to go in that direction. I guess if if you're if you're optimistic, but but you know, I think one thing that maybe one would want to know more in volume two of your of your work is whether you know there were efficiencies in this system. I mean, aside from avoiding um, avoiding strikes, which obviously uh, cause you know losses. Whether there is you know something about this system that uh, that enhanced productivity, right? Um, I think I think yeah. the theory there would be, you know, one theory might be because um, at least this this is the way the the union theory runs at the time, right? Is well, if wages are high, you're going to have an incentive to keep investing and and doing uh, labor saving technologies, and that's going to increase productivity. And then when wages are low, you have less incentive to innovate uh, labor-saving productivity, you know, enhancing technologies. Um, you know, I haven't looked into that, if that's actually- yeah. what But I don't see, I, yeah, I don't see, so th this is the danger in uh, looking back to the 50s and the 60s. Right, it's a- Because it, it, unless you think Trump was right, I mean, if Trump is right, uh, you have to close down the borders with tariffs to make any of this happen. Because as Eric pointed out, Shareholders are just, or and you, as you said, Sam, they're just happy to kind of go along in the 50s and 60s. What other choice do they have? Right. In a world in which you try to recreate this system and capital can flow to China and Japan and, and Brazil, it will just go there and the stuff will come back to our shores. So if you want to try to change capital flows, you need giant tariffs. Um, you know, and of course, this is what the Republicans wanted, not just Trump, but if you read about Carnegie and Rockefeller and the titans of the Gilded Age, this was their view. We yeah. need big, completely cartelized industries where we all can cooperate. We'll do our share, whether it's a $5 day or Carnegie's agreed to have scaled profits in his steel mills in Pittsburgh and Homestead mm -hmm. and huge tariffs. And that's what the Republicans were all for. That system breaks down. It still exists in the 50s and 60s because of World War II you can't put that genie back in the bottle unless you go to what Trump wanted. Yeah, I mean, so much of, I mean, that's the question too, right? Is it's, and certainly the way I learned, uh, you know, in macroeconomics a very long time ago, um, you know, when they say, why was the 50s and the 60s different? Well, it's, you got all this pent up demand, all this pent up productivity from the 30s. Now, I think now we say, well, maybe there was some more technological development at the time and, and it's being put into place, but certainly you're getting the scale, you're getting the demand. And once you get the, you know, those are the low hanging fruits of the 20th century, you're not going to be able to get back to that no matter how much you shut down uh, the borders, no matter how much you, uh, you know, cartelize everything and put it back in that dynamics, just that was a one time historical event. And now we hear it, right? Computers, we hear it with uh, telework with VR, all these, and, and nothing ever seems to match in the long run, those types of low hanging fruits. I haven't looked, you know, that is the theory. That's a conventional story, which I think I'm, I'm accepting at the time being, I'd love to go back and say, well, what's, what's really going on here. Um, but that does seem to be, I think, you know, it, the, the idea that this is just a one time, it's not going to happen again. Uh, no matter if you just recreate the, uh, the trappings on the period. I think we're out of time, aren't we? What time do we end? Uh, we're running, running low. Libby, do we have time for questions or from the? Yeah, it's, it's I, a really good time to, to start wrapping up now. Um, I know we've gotten a couple comments in the chat, but um, hopefully we will, just like Professor Henderson said, maybe have a another event for volume two of the book. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We really, really do appreciate everyone joining today. Um, and keep an eye out on the Law School's YouTube channel for this recording, share widely with friends and family. Um, thank you again to Samuel for um, writing his book and thank you to Professor Henderson and Professor Posner. Thanks Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations Samuel, it was, it's a great book. Thank you, thank you all for coming and, and thank all you right. Professor Henderson, thank you Professor Posner.